From the folks are singing around the tree, singing around the tree, everyone you see. What is the latest melody that's caught the young idea? From a cheeky to secret and I'll whisper in your ear. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I always work on the theory that whenever I start these things, two people will walk through the door three minutes in. I think they stand outside with a stopwatch. Uh, Good evening and welcome to another in our continuing series of public lectures on aspects of the First World War, uh, sponsored by the Western Front Association. Uh, And as you can see, the WFA are recording this. Um, Anybody who objects to being recorded, you forfeited that when you walked through that door and read that notice. Uh, Beyond that, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Spencer Jones, Uh, who has the longest title of any lecturer uh, in our department, Senior Lecturer in War Studies and Armed Forces, and anything else? That's about right. right. Thanks very much, Spence. Also the official historian uh, for the Royal Artillery, um, and among his several published books and rising career, um, Spencer edited uh, the first of the... Wolverhampton Military Studies series books, Stemming the Tide on the British Army in 1914, uh, which appeared two years ago. And he edited the tenth of them, which appeared last month, the book launch on the British Army in 1915, Courage Without Glory. Uh, This evening, speaking to us on Toothless Lions, the Royal Artillery and the Firepower Crisis of 1915, before... I hand over. He just, I've forgotten, asked me to mention that he is a West Brom supporter. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. Well, I am a West Brom fan, as some of you know, so I am competing on hostile territory tonight. And more so than that, and to continue the tenuous footballing metaphor, I'm actually a substitute in tonight's talk. You were going to be treated to the wonderful Aniko Mombauer talking about the origins of the First World War, but we couldn't get her in time. So instead, I was put into the fray instead. And... I'm going to be talking, to continue the hostile territory metaphor, about a time when the Royal Artillery was very much in hostile territory. As Stephen mentioned, I am the official historian of the Royal Artillery, and part of my duty in this role is to promote and preserve Royal Artillery history. And this involves going around various batteries, giving talks about the history of the battery, about its achievements and so on. And at the start of 2015, I was asked, can you draw something up about the Royal Artillery in 1915 to promote its achievements? And I said, well, that might be a little bit tricky, actually. Well, why, why is this? Well, actually, it was a dreadful year for the British Army, and it was an especially difficult year for the Royal Artillery. And it's actually from that initial meeting I had at the start of the year about what did the Royal Artillery do in 1915 that this talk has been derived. And one of the nice things about coming and speaking to this audience as opposed to the gunners at Lark Hill is I can actually say what I really think about the Royal Artillery without fear of counter-battery fire uh, coming in. Oh, no, there's a, <laughs> forget ex-gunners in the audience as well. So, what this talk will do is give you a broad overview of what the Royal Artillery faced in 1915, the problems it encountered, and what I like to call the terrible trinity to respectfully paraphrase that great German military philosopher Karl von Clausewitz, the terrible trinity that constrained everything that the Royal Artillery attempted to do in 1915. And as you'll see, the problems faced by the Royal Artillery in some ways act as a microcosm of the problems faced by the British Army as a whole. And if there's one thing that I think has emerged academically from the study of 1915 this year, it's that 1915 as a year On the Western Front for the British Army, it was far worse than perhaps history has given it credit for. If anything, the research has turned up even more problems, difficulties and setbacks than we first uh, or we initially imagined. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why 1915 has lain barely disturbed in the historiography for so long. It simply does not make very pleasant reading, a fact that even James Edmonds admitted in the very first volume of the official history. So what was the situation? at the start of 1915. Simply, it was deadlock. 
As we know, the Western Front had been established in about November 1940, and the failure of the German offensive at the First Battle of Ypres had brought mobile warfare on the Western Front to a halt. French attacks in December, and indeed some small British attacks, not to mention German attacks in January, had failed to make very much impression on the Western Front, and deadlock ensued. There's a common misconception and it has been repeated during this centenary year that the British Army, and indeed all armies as a whole, were left baffled by the emergence of trench warfare in late 14, early 15. This is not strictly true. The British, as we know, had considerable experience of facing enemy trenches in action gained in the Boer War. The Germans, the French and the British, for that matter, all had substantial experience of observing trench warfare in the Russo-Japanese War. The appearance of trench warfare per se was not the surprise. The surprise was its scale, whereas in the, even in the Russo-Japanese War, sometimes held up as that great trench warfare conflict, there were still flanks to turn, albeit often secured on difficult terrain, and ultimately the attacker, the Japanese, got through Russian trenches. On the Western Front in 1915, this was not the case. There were no flanks to turn. The Western Front was blanketed by, or bracketed by the English Channel on one side, and of course the Swiss border on the, the other. Outmanoeuvring the Western Front was not a possibility in 1915, unless you went to a different theatre of war entirely, ergo Gallipoli. But the British were not as bewildered by the experience of finding itself facing trench warfare as commonly supposed. And indeed, one of the first things that was done in early 1915 was the Royal Artillery sat down on the orders of GHQ and began to ponder the best way to break down the German defences that now stood in front of them. The assumption through, that ran throughout both the British and French armies was that this would be a temporary state of affairs. And in this, they were not necessarily making an unwise judgment. Remember that the Russo-Japanese War, again, always held as this example of trench warfare, had been ended by the aggressor, the Japanese, ultimately breaking through the Russian defences. And there was little to suppose that this would not be the case on the Western Front. And so the Royal Artillery viewed the problem of artillery support in trench warfare in terms of it being a precursor to more open warfare. Sanders Marble has argued, not incorrectly, that the Royal Artillery viewed battle in two fashions. An open battle, an encounter battle, which would involve a degree of manoeuvre, but might incorporate trenches and field works, and siege warfare, a more prolonged operation that would uh, be undertaken over a matter of weeks and require specialist artillery. The Royal Artillery at the start of 1915 saw trench warfare as a field warfare problem, that the trenches were an obstacle to be breached before the manoeuvre returned to the Western Front. And so they set about uh, devising uh, solutions to the problems they faced with this in mind. And the essential problem was this. How do you overcome the German defences that stand in front of you? And a picture here of the formidable Hohenzollern Redoubt set, taken from the air in September 1915 gives you an impression of the depth of the German defences in the later stage of 1915 that would be faced. But in early 15, this was not the case. In many sectors of the front facing the British Army, the German defences were relatively shallow. Remember that the primary sectors for Britain in early 15 are Ypres, which by its definition was very much battle-scarred at the start of 1915, um, still a, a very heavily damaged area where the trenches are still under construction, and Orbers Ridge, where because of the very high water table, digging deep trenches is simply impossible, or it's very, very difficult, and so both sides resorted to parapeted defences instead. These, by the standards of even later in the year, were not as formidable as they might have seemed. And the Royal Artillery in early 15 took, undertook the work of constructing a number of dummy German positions, primarily based on the model that they could observe at Orbers Ridge, parapeted positioned, relatively shallow, screened by single belts of barbed wire. A variety of uh, experiments were carried out, and it was, they were broadly promising. It was found that shrapnel could breach German barbed wire, and high explosive rounds or heavier howitzer rounds could demolish German parapets. And the idea was that once the parapet had been breached in uh, several places, it would be easy enough for shrapnel to rain down through these gaps and also for British infantry to pierce the trenches and thence move onwards. And once that initial trench line had been taken, the problem became one of more traditional fire support, which the Royal Artillery felt exceedingly comfortable dealing with. But in the process of studying this breakdown of um, German defences 
The Royal Artillery began to realise that there was a lot more to breaching the German lines than just breaching that first line. In actual fact, even in the early experiments, and soon after, after the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle, when more detailed studies were made, the Royal Artillery identified that a German position effectively had four problems to overcome. The first, and the most obvious, was the barbed wire belt. British experience in December 1914 had set the tone for how they viewed barbed wire. In 1914, some British attacks had gone forward with virtually no artillery support and with infantry carrying heavy sacks, which they were to lay over the top of the barbed wire and then clamber over them. This had proven hopelessly inadequate. Although it was possible to breach very um, shallow barbed wire using wire nippers, this was not a practical uh, move for a large scale assault. If the barbed wire belt was not breached, then no attack could succeed. And bear in mind that at this stage, the artillery saw its problem very much in terms of providing enough fire support for the infantry to close with the Germans. Once the, they were in contact with the German um, defenders, the artillery's job changed and it became one of support in more deeper areas. British could not close with the Germans if the barbed wire was in place. It stopped attacks utterly and it interfered with the fundamentals of British infantry tactics of the time, which was, of course, the system of fire and movement, which had been used by the British in, with some success in 1914. Fire and movement did not work if the movement was constrained by the barbed wire belt. The barbed wire belt, therefore, had to be breached for any attack to be successful, and the artillery identified this problem very swiftly. The second problem was enemy trenches. Because of the nature of German trenches, especially at the Auburs Ridge area, which would be the main sector which was under attack from uh, March to May 1915, because of these parapeted defences, it was not simply enough to sh fire shrapnel onto the German trenches. The parapets were designed in such a way as to stop most incoming shrapnel fire and provided a good degree of cover from shrapnel bursts that appeared above the trench. Therefore, it was necessary to target the trenches with high explosive, to breach the parapet and to expose the defenders to incoming shrapnel fire. Even better than that was the use of howitzers to actually drop shells directly into the German trenches, for which there would be no protection and which the parapet uh, would be completely bypassed. And the blast effect from British high explosive, even from the medium field howitzers, the 4.5s, was sufficient to cause severe damage to the mock-ups of German trenches, which gave encouragement to the gunners that if they could be accurate enough, they could seriously destroy the German trenches. The point here is that the artillery did not propose to try and wipe out the German defenders, merely to damage their defences sufficiently that they couldn't, the defenders could not stop the attack as it went through the gaps in the barbed wire. That the defenders would be concussed, they'd have suffered casualties, they would be under fire as the infantry closed on them, and as long as the British infantry could get into contact with the Germans, the artillery felt it had done its job. There was an assumption that once the British were in contact, the melee that would follow would incline towards the attacker. But targeting the enemy trenches was an important point. Initially, all the focus, of course, was on the first trench because diverting fire into second and later third lines was considered wasteful. Why divert that fire in the initial bombardment? If you don't breach the first line, it's irrelevant how much damage you do to the second line. The second and third lines will be dealt with with follow-up bombardments after the initial line had been breached. So there were two primary targets, the barbed wire belt and the enemy trenches. Something that had emerged during the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle and which would become more prominent later at Auburs Ridge in Festiburg was the presence of German strong points. These strong points varied in type and design, but essentially they were fixed positions where the Germans would either deploy machine guns or could bring a machine gun into once an attack had begun. They were generally reinforced, often built around abandoned farm buildings or other rubble. Some of them were concealed within the trenches, others were placed uh, between uh, German trench lines at various strategic points from which they could sweep uh, the, any attacker with firepower. These enemy strong points had been especially devastating at the Battle of Auburs Ridge and would continue to plague the British, not merely through 15, but also through 1916, 17 and even 1918. Finding the enemy strong points was difficult enough. The Germans were excellent at camouflaging them, once you'd found them, destroying them also proved difficult. If you destroyed the strong point too early, the Germans would simply move that weapon if it survived or they would redeploy to a different strong point. If you left it too late, you might not be able to get enough hits on the strong point to actually destroy it and therefore it would open fire once the attack began. 
And actually destroying the strong point was extremely difficult. The Royal Artillery was not well equipped with material destroying weapons in 1915. Heavy howitzers were ideal for this work, but they were in desperately short supply. And it was often felt they were better used bombarding the enemy's trenches rather than trying to put uh, precision shots onto individual strong points. But as 1915 wore on, the need to eliminate strong points became all the more paramount. And a sort of deadly game of double bluff began. Did the British try and destroy the strong points long before the attack? Or did they wait until the last minute to try and engage them? And the Germans played this game themselves, sometimes setting up dummy strong points, sometimes having the strong points unoccupied and only rushing the machine guns into them at the last minute. This would prove an intractable problem for the British in 1915 that was never truly solved. And a problem that was not solved at all in the Royal Artillery's plans was how to eliminate enemy artillery. One of the lessons of the Boer War had been that counter-battery fire in modern warfare, where guns are often considerably beyond easy visual range, was extraordinarily difficult. It had been proven in 1914 at the First Battle of Ypres, where a substantial body of German artillery had often found, it frustrated, found itself frustrated by British guns hidden behind the lines that continued to fire even when under very heavy bombardment. The problem in 1915 was worse still. The Germans were more heavily gunned, they possessed high, larger numbers of higher calibre weapons than the British, and they had the advantage of fighting from the other side of the hill. The Germans, by virtue of their position at Orbers Ridge, possessed the tiny fragment of high ground, Orbers Ridge itself. The name Orbers Ridge conjures up visions of Vimy. In actual fact, Orbers Ridge is about 20 feet high for most of its length, rising to perhaps a peak of 70 feet. But the surrounding terrain is so flat that even that tiny advantage was enough to give the Germans decisive artillery observation and also to be able to conceal their own artillery from British visual uh, spotting from the front line. Only aerial photography and aerial reconnaissance could identify uh, German artillery batteries behind the line and that was a process that was very much in its infancy. In the absence of the ability to see the German artillery and with photo reconnaissance such a new concept, counter-battery fire within Royal Artillery fire plans was basic at best. As one gunner said, it consisted of nothing more than a few hopeful shots into a region where we briefly thought the Germans might have positioned their guns. But this created a problem. Because no matter how thoroughly you had shattered the first three targets, of the German line, the barbed wire, the enemy trenches, and even in the, the enemy strong points, you would still, the, the attacking infantry would still have to contend with incoming German artillery fire. And a striking feature of the battles of 1915, with the exception of Neuve Chapelle, where the Germans were very poorly equipped with artillery at the start of the engagement, is that once the British attack begins, German artillery begins firing in earnest and indeed even targeting the assembly trenches for British units, causing as much damage to troops preparing to go over the top as those moving through no man's land. And there's no better example of this than Orbers Ridge, where a terrific amount of damage is actually done to the British frontline trenches by completely unsuppressed German artillery. And the Royal Artillery is effectively helpless to engage the German artillery in any sort of systematic way. Attempts to designate units for counter-battery work, particularly 60-pounders with their substantial range, ultimately flounder on the lack of reconnaissance and the simple inability to locate German guns in 1915. And to an extent, the Royal Artillery almost gives up on the idea of really dealing with German artillery in 15, and simply emphasises that if we can shatter those first three targets, the infantry will be so deep into the German position the Germans won't fire on them. That's the hope, but of course, it's a hope that ultimately is not born out in reality. An issue that has been raised, or a problem that has been raised really, by academics since the First World War, is the fact that the British artillery focused upon, certainly from the middle of 15 onwards, destruction of enemy positions, complete and utter devastation of the wire, the trenches and strong points, rather than suppression. And it's been argued by a number of historians that suppression was actually the key to victory, um, not merely in 15, but also later in the war, when it became apparent that you didn't need to kill every German in the front line, you didn't need to shatter every trench in the front, uh, German trench, you just need to stop the incoming fire long enough for your infantry to go forward. This concept certainly does not seem to have been particularly under well understood in 1915, but I think we can take too much from hindsight here. Suppression and destruction are not mutually exclusive. If your trenches are being torn to shreds by high explosive and 
shrapnel's raining down on you and killing you, you're also going to be suppressed at the same time. The idea that the two uh, in 1915 were radically different concepts, I think, can be misleading. The artillery saw both uh, as occurring effectively at the same time. You would destroy the enemy trenches and you would be simultaneously suppressing and silencing, to use the terminology of the day, the defenders. Furthermore, the criticism that some historians have made that suppression was the obvious answer to 1915 ignores the fact that the British infantry could only close with the Germans if the barbed wire belt was breached and the parapet was knocked down. We're apt to forget that the parapets of 15 were something of an anomaly, were not, would not become widely used again in 16. If those parapets remained standing, it was very difficult for the British to breach them in any sort of number. Therefore, there had to be a destructive element to the bombardment, otherwise the infantry attack would fail absolutely. It was hopeless to suppress the German trenches if the infantry could not close with them. And so arguing that the two were quite distinct forms is actually somewhat misleading in the context of 1915. The two were actually complementary and the Royal Artillery saw that uh, attempting to destroy the German trenches would also simultaneously suppress their defenders. And in this sense the artillery were not wrong. Their experiments were broadly promising and their experience of battle in March 1915 at Neuve Chapelle held greater promise still. With a few exceptions on the front where artillery had been inaccurate, the bombardment caught the Germans by surprise, it allowed the infantry to breach the initial trench and the fact that the battle miscarried afterwards was not anything to do with the pre-battle bombardment. But as we know, an attempt to repeat the trick of Neuve Chapelle at Orbers Ridge in May failed spectacularly at the cost of some 11,500 casualties. From that point onwards, the Royal Artillery moved towards a system of prolonged bombardments, usually four days long, of relatively slow-paced fire with an emphasis on destroying barbed wire and strong points, with a, a greater speed of bombardment building before the attack to try and destroy enemy trenches and parapets. But whether it was a hurricane bombardment or a methodical bombardment, the Royal Artillery was limited by what I term the terrible trinity, of related problems around its employment. The first of these problems was inexperience. I mentioned at the top of this lecture that trench warfare per se was not unknown to the British Army, or indeed the French or the German Army. What was unknown was warfare on this scale and of this intensity. This was entirely new to the British. Their experience in South Africa was a good tactical guide but in larger operational terms, it was dwarfed by what was now required on the Western Front. Furthermore, the intensity of opposition, or sorry, the ferocity of opposition that the Germans could put up was something that was unknown to the British. The Germans had superior equipment, generally superior training, uh, and were in occupying defensive positions, which were much super, had much superior advantages to the British. This was something new. And although tactical lessons from previous wars could be applied, the sheer scale of the problem, the scale of the defences and the effectiveness of the opposition all made this task far more difficult. And the army had to learn from the ground up. The experiments of January 15 showed that it was possible to severely damage German trenches. But it took the battle experience of March and May to actually show how this played out in practice and how the Germans were likely to react to various situations they encountered. Otherwise, inexperience was rife throughout the Royal Artillery, as it was throughout the British Army as a whole. CRAs, Commander Royal Artilleries, at divisional and corps level were inexperienced themselves. Um, some have been promoted uh, very, very rapidly, as with the expansion of the Army from 15, racing from battery commander into a CRA position. But reflective of the lack of experience of the army as a whole in this type of trench warfare, they lacked authority. It was still an advisory role, as it had been before the First World War. It remained essentially an advisory role until quite late in 1915. The level of authority possessed by CRAs was open to debate, and it varied from division to division. It's interesting that Henry Horne himself, um, with an artillery background, was very keen on taking his CRA's advice. Other divisional commanders were less impressed. And furthermore, sometimes put across in various academic works that the CRAs as a body thought with one mind, this was not true. The CRAs themselves were inexperienced, and although they were artillerymen themselves, they did not, uh, by definition, have a solution to the problems of the Western Front. They were inexperienced, they were inexperienced in handling this 
lot, this quantity of guns in this type of warfare on this type of scale. And they had to learn themselves. Sometimes um, divisional and corps, indeed army commanders, would ignore the advice of their CRAs. This does not necessarily mean that the commander was wrong. It may have been simply that the CRA had no better answers than the commander or deferred to that commander's decision. There was no consistency of thought amongst CRAs. And these CRAs presided over a hugely expanded Royal Artillery uh, that continued to expand throughout 1915. I think something that we, we tend to underestimate is the extent to which the, um, the artillery of 1915 was as de-skilled as its infantry companions were in the frontline trenches. While the artillery did not suffer the chronic level of battalion commander attrition that the infantry had suffered in 1914, it still suffered attrition of its own amongst both officers and crews. And furthermore, it had a much smaller pool of reservists to draw upon to expand its fighting body. Furthermore, on top of that, of course, artillery work is by definition considerably more technical than that of infantry work. It takes longer to train an artilleryman. It had done before the war and it would do during the war. And so to actually create, a, find crews for, these, for the newly formed batteries, for the newly incoming artillery, proved difficult and necessitated a very large proportion of dugouts and reservists being recalled to the colours, who were, in the words of James Edmonds, the polite and phrase of James Edmonds, were not well schooled in the use of modern guns. And this, this is an understatement of the century. The vast majority of reservists and dugouts had not fired 18 pounders, the modern field gun of the British Army. Certainly very few reservists had any experience with a 4.5 inch howitzer, a gun that would become very important in the First World War, which had only been introduced in 1909. Dugouts, dugout officers, the proportion in the infantry was about 50%. There's no comparable statistics that we have at the moment for the artillery, but it's not unreasonable to assume that it may have been even higher due to the smaller pool of reservists the artillery had to draw upon. Bear in mind the artillery had gone through a very big tactical overhaul in the aftermath of the Boer War of 1902. There have been very fierce arguments about whether guns should engage from concealed positions, from the open. New weapons had come in. There had been a huge amount of discussion about tactics and training that had gone through a number of phases and only really settled uh, these debates, only really begun to settle between 1910 and 1912. So officers who had left the service earlier than this date were often antiquarian in their views. Furthermore, the Royal Artillery is a fiercely independently minded branch. Individual battery commanders have their own way of doing things uh, and they will be damned if they are interfered with by anybody else. This was picked up by a number of officers during 1915 that these older dugout battery commanders would arrive on the Western Front with an attitude that what was good for me 10 years ago or 15 years ago will be just as good for me now. And in combination with inexperienced crews or reservist crews, this meant that achieving things like unity of fire fire plans that were followed by all batteries, accurate fire, proper logistic arrangements, and many other issues relating to effective artillery fire was very, very difficult. Furthermore, coordinating batteries, even the ones that were from the same division, were in the same brigade of the same division proved difficult. Coordinating multiple divisions or even core level fire proved extraordinarily difficult, not least because of the inexperience of commanders and crews at all levels. Something that's quite striking of the Artillery of 15 is there's no unity of thought. There's a huge variety of separate ideas milling around within the artillery. Some coming from cap battery captains, some coming from CRAs attached to divisions, and a whole multitude of concepts moving around in between. There's no unity of thought. And this, in some ways, is reflective of the fierce debates that had gone on in the artillery before the war, now intensified as the artillery faces a new and dangerous opponent. And it's only really after the Battle of Luce in September 15 that there's any particular evidence of the artillery sitting down as a body and saying, what have we learned from this? The artillery, I would say, had their watershed moment at Luce, whereas perhaps the Army as a whole has it at the Somme the next year. Luce is a change in how the artillery approaches the business of coordinating itself, coordinating its fire plans and assessing its own lessons. Up till that point, there's a great deal of individual learning and individual ideas but very little evidence that there's any sort of unity of thought either amongst CRAs or battery commanders. <laughs>
And furthermore, even if there had been unity of thought, even if the artillery had somehow come up with the silver bullet to solve the problems of um, the Western Front, the artillery had a culture of subordination to the infantry. This was um, embodied in their slogan, their credo, found in field artillery training, the greater the difficulties of the infantry, the greater the support should be of the artillery. The artillery did not see itself as a... Um, a separate branch. It saw itself as intrinsically linked to the infantry and as subordinate in many ways to their wishes, their needs and their desires. And this was reflected not merely in the artillery, who were quite happy to be subordinate to the uh, wishes of higher command, but also in higher command, who tended to create their plans and then simply tell the artillery what they wanted, rather than asking the artillery, what are you capable of, and then shaping the plan around this. And I think there's an element of pride as well in the artillery. There is evidence, particularly from mid-15 onwards, of commanders asking their CRA, what can you do? And CRA has been very proud to, to say, we can do anything you want, and accepting very ambitious uh, objectives, even though on some level they must have known this is going to be an extremely difficult task uh, for the gunners. So this inexperience, this culture, this pre-war culture, the ongoing debates in the artillery all hampered the ability of the gunners to perform the, the roles that they were required to carry out the destruction of German positions. But even if they'd been a lot more experienced, even if they had been very highly trained and had a unity of thought, they were gravely hampered by the second problem of the terrible trinity, equipment. The British Army as a whole in 1915 was extraordinarily poorly equipped for the type of war which it found itself engaged upon. Just to give you um, an impression of how undergunned the Royal Artillery was, in May 1915, at about the time of the Battle of Festiburg, mid-May, there were just 65 modern heavy calibre weapons available to the Royal Artillery on the Western Front. To give you, to put that into some sort of context, the Germans, and this, although this encompasses the entire Western Front, possessed just under 600 heavy calibre pieces spread across the Western Front. So the Germans out outgunned the British in, Royal, in heavy artillery almost 10 to 1. The problems were not merely with heavy calibre weapons either. Over 2,018 pounders, the standard field piece of the Royal Artillery, had been ordered by the end of 1914. By mid-15, just over 800 had been delivered. Less than half had actually been manufactured. British industry could simply not keep up with the insatiable demand for weaponry and guns. And it was especially problematic with the heavy um, branches. The Royal Artillery had possessed a single heavy gun design, or modern heavy gun design, before the First World War, the 60-pounder, which had been introduced after the Boer War. There were just four of these per division in 1914, and as early as September 1914, the supply ran out. The 7th Division had to go to war with much older guns in its heavy battery instead of modern 60-pounders. <coughs> Other heavy weapons, such as heavy howitzers, uh, siege weapons, began to appear in tiny numbers in 1915, but without standardised patterns on which to manufacture, prototypes were deployed instead. And all of this, as well as the lack of field guns, meant that the Royal Artillery was phenomenally undergunned when facing these problems. With an absence of heavy weapons, weapons of Boer War vintage were brought back into service, including this one here, the 4.7-inch gun, um, with Canadian gun crew training on it in Britain in 1915. The 4.7-inch is an interesting example of improvisation. It had been an improvised weapon of 1899. It was actually a naval gun mounted on a howitzer carriage that had been introduced into the Boer War to try and deal with um, Boer long tom, heavy 155mm guns. It had had some success in South Africa, but it had not been a universal success. Some condemned it as the cow gun because it was so slow and heavy it had to be towed by oxen. Uh, and this was also a comment on how difficult it was to actually manoeuvre the thing once it was off from its limber. As soon as the 60 pounder had become available in 1904, the 4.7 inch had begun to be phased out. But of course, demands of war brought it back into service. It was not an effective weapon. It was known as strict neutrality by the troops because it shelled friend and foe alike. And gunners themselves were not immune from its baleful effects. It, could, it was known for its premature, so it would sometimes detonate rounds in the barrel, which would, of course, kill or injure or severely shake the crew. And yet, this was the only heavy field gun that the British had in any significant numbers in 1915, and it was brought back into service. It was 
Many of these guns had lain mothballed for years, they'd not fired properly, their barrels were worn, their carriages were rotting, and their ammunition was too light, really, at 45 pounds a shell, to do much significant damage. But this was the heavy gun which the Royal Artillery relied upon for much of its bombarding power in 1915. Other guns came too. The 15-pounder, which was the a traditional British field gun of the 1890s, a weapon that had been found inadequate in both terms of range, accuracy and rapidity of fire in South Africa and had been phased out in favour of the 18-pounder. 15-pounder guns were brought back into service with gun shields, for the, the originals lacked gun shields that would protect the crew, gun shields swiftly welded onto the gun to give them some protection from German counter-battery fire. These weapons had been considered inadequate in 1899, they were no better in 1915. And yet for absence of weapons, they too were deployed. And yet even if you had modern guns to continue this train of thought, ammunition was in desperately short supply in 1915. For just as British industry laboured to actually build the guns, it laboured even more so to provide ammunition for them. Imports were brought in from America, industry attempted to expand to fill the need, but it was always in short supply. Indeed, the initial artillery plan for the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle in March 1915 was rejected by Robertson at GHQ, who noted, um, with, again quite understatement, you do realise that this represents the entire stock of artillery ammunition on the Western Front. Similar problems were found after the, um, the Battle of Festubert in, in mid-1915, May 1915, the Royal Artillery was basically impotent for want of ammunition. And whenever the, uh, the Royal Artillery wanted to do was planning a big show, it had to ration ammunition in the weeks leading up to it to ensure it had enough to support the actual battle. Even if you managed to stockpile enough shells to carry out a significant bombardment, as the artillery did at Nerve Chapelle, Orbers, Festival and Luce, the reliability of many of these shells was exceedingly doubtful. It's been estimated that as many as 25 or 20 to 25 percent of shells fired at Luce were misfires, uh, were, were duds, did not detonate. A number of eyewitnesses talk about the number of unexploded shells littering the battlefield at the end of the engagement. There's little reason to doubt that those statistics probably applied to Festiber, Orbers and Nerve Chapelle as well. The rate of duds was extremely high. And of course, given the problems I've already mentioned, old guns with worn barrels firing um, unreliable ammunition, you can see how any bombardment would lose effectiveness very rapidly indeed. The ammunition was most short for the heavy guns, and there's a quote I'd like to offer from William Robertson here, commenting, for the past three days we have received a total of three rounds for our three 15-inch howitzers. The Germans yesterday fired 47 rounds of this calibre at certain places, merely as a joke. Um, the Royal Artillery did not not see the funny side, but the 15-inch howitzers, which were the first really super heavy guns the British had on the Western Front, were chronically limited for artillery. Billy Congreve, son of Walter Congreve, commented sourly in his diary that although the 15 inches should certainly terrify the Hun, we only have one round per gun per day and two on a Sunday. There was simply not enough ammunition to do anything other than hoard these weapons hoard this ammunition and use it in bombardments. And so, combination, the inexperience of the gunners was further exacerbated by the serious lack of firepower. And this is where the firepower crisis is to be found. The British simply lacked the weight of material and the quantity of ammunition to be able to carry out really effective, significant bombardments. And the final element of the terrible trinity is the methods that were employed. This has actually been the source of the most historical criticism, I would say, the most academic criticism, has focused upon the methods used by the artillery. But in actual fact, the methods were less important than the inexperience and the lack of equipment I've shown you. For given those two problems, any method that was employed would inevitably be diminished in its effectiveness. You could have the best methodology in the world, but if half of your shells or a quarter of your shells are duds, you're not going to get the results that you hope. The Royal Artillery effectively had two separate phases during 1915. The first was the hurricane bombardment period. Hurricane bombardments were used at Neuve Chapelle in March and then repeated at Orbers Ridge in May. Both contemporaries and historians have argued that the abandonment of hurricane bombardments was a mistake. They certainly, it certainly achieved success at Neuve Chapelle where it genuinely did both 
largely destroy the German defences and stun and surprise the Germans. The artillery had been moved into position secretly, registered without alerting the Germans, and then in 35 minutes of sudden violence, demolished effectively most of the German front line, allowing uh, a breach to be made. And historians and indeed some contemporaries have argued that this should have been repeated uh, a lot more than it actually was. The problem was the British did repeat it uh, on, a, on a slightly larger scale at Orbers Ridge two months later. Why two months later? Well, this was partially because of the artillery problems. It was also because of the German offensive at Second Eve, but it was largely because to sustain another serious offensive, the British needed to stockpile their ammunition enough to carry out another bombardment. And the Orbers Ridge fire plan, such as it was, was essentially a rerun of the methods that had been used at Neuve Chapelle. A sudden hurricane bombardment, this time lasting 40 minutes, an additional five from Neuve Chapelle, would sweep the German front line and allow the infantry to attack and breach the front. Of course, as we know, it failed spectacularly. The German front was not breached, the infantry attack was repulsed, no ground was gained, and 11,500 casualties were suffered. It was, until, up till this point, the worst day in British Army history in terms of casualties killed and wounded. It was a startling defeat. And on the same day that the British, with their hurricane bombardment, misfired so completely, the French, further to the south at Vimy Ridge, achieved a near breakthrough. Well, indeed, there was a breakthrough of several thousand yards uh, with an assault launched by the French Colonial Division that had been preceded by a methodical, destructive bombardment in quite a striking contrast to the hurricane fire that had been employed at Orbers. Why did it fail at Orbers? It was essentially because the British attempted the same fire plan with approximately the same amount of firepower, but over a much wider front, therefore diminishing the density of shells. Fewer shells fell per yard of trench at Orbers Ridge than they had at Neuve Chapelle. And furthermore, the Germans had considerably increased their defences. The Germans had been startled by what had happened to them at Neuve Chapelle and had responded with typical efficiency and had improved their defensive structures, in particularly thickening the wire, increasing the number of trench lines and redoubling the number of strong points that studied the, the, the defences. And so the artillery attempted to do in May the same trick with less firepower per, 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 per square yard against a far stronger position than that which they had assaulted in March. The results were almost inevitable. It was not a failure of method per se, but a failure of planning and a failure to realise the Germans had improved their defences so much. We're apt to forget, given what happens in 16 and 17, the cost of the battles there, how much of a shock Orbers Ridge was for the British Army. It was a startling, a startling and absolute defeat. There was nothing positive to take from this battle whatsoever. It was also a political humiliation because the French had achieved success on the same day and, of course, insisted the British renew the offensive to continue um, to support their... Um, efforts down at Vimy Ridge, which resulted in the Battle of Festiburt a little more than a week, a little under a week later. Festiburt was preceded by a very different type of bombardment. As the hurricane bombardment had failed so spectacularly, it was decided to adopt the French method, a methodical bombardment over uh, several days that would aim to cause maximum destruction of barbed wire, strong points and enemy trenches with fire building to a crescendo, not to the level of the hurricane bombardments, but a crescendo nevertheless as zero hour approach to try and suppress the German defences in time for the infantry to get across. And this was also the method that would be used at Luce in September and October. This has been criticised. It was criticised by contemporaries and criticised by historians that the disaster at Albers Ridge should not have put the British off hurricane bombardment so completely. Hurricane bombardment would not really return until 1917. But of course we have to put this in context. We know, or the British knew that the French had achieved success with methodical bombardments and we knew that hurricane bombardments had failed absolutely in May 1915. With the pressure to carry out a, a, a swift follow-up attack, we were always going to use a method that appeared to offer the highest chance of success, and this was the methodical bombardment. And the relative success achieved at Festiver in May further gave weight to carrying out similar methods at Luce in September and October. And yet, these methodical bombardments and the hurricane bombardments revealed that the artillery did not understand, or did not seem to understand, the difference between weight of fire, the sheer amount of shells you fired, the sheer weight of the guns you had in operation, and density of fire. It was density of fire that caused the most destruction and caused the greatest disruption. 
At this stage of the war, this does not seem to have been fully appreciated. A handful of artillery commanders did appreciate this and commented upon it. But of course, given the disaster at Orbers Ridge, it was difficult to make the case for a return to hurricane bombardment operations. And this was, of course, reinforced by the relative success in comparison of Festiburg. This does not seem to have been understood as being a source of criticism ever since. But we have to bear in mind the inexperience of the artillery, the problems it had with ammunition and equipment, and of course the constant pressure on it to perform. I think we can be a little bit harsh judging with the benefit of hindsight. What was clear though from the methods that the Royal Artillery had was that all attempts to provide responsive fire support failed. Communications simply did not permit accurate and rapid responsive fire support. When troops, and this happened frequently at Festiburg, went beyond the front line and encountered new German strong points, it was extremely difficult for the artillery to engage them in a timely manner. Numerous methods were tried to overcome this problem. Forward, uh, forward observation officers went forward with telephones to try and carry out observation, but the, the flat nature of the ground which the British Army was fighting in for most of this period meant that the FOOs could see very little and the records are full of frustration from these FOOs that they go forward and they simply cannot see targets from the flat ground which they occupy. And so they, um, they could not provide responsive fire support. Sending messages back, hand-carried messages, was too slow. By the time the battery commanders or the, the artillery support had received the message, quite often the battle had spun far beyond the initial problem. Aerial uh, cooperation was tried in numerous fashions but ultimately did not succeed. A variety of methods were tried including dropping smoke bombs to try and indicate targets. Infantry at Orbers Ridge went forward carrying large white markers that were to be placed on the ground for aerial observers to see but of course the, no breakthrough occurred and so they were not used. There were attempts to drop streamers from aircraft to uh, indicate priority targets and there were the very first experiments with um, that had begun in 1914, expanded in 15, with wireless communication from the air to the ground. But at this stage, it was one way. The aircraft could signal to the gunners, but the gunners could not signal back. And this method became very dangerous in late 1915, as the Fokker Eindecker, the first plane that could shoot through its propeller with the benefit of an interrupter gear, began to inflict serious damage on British reconnaissance assets, which in turn diminished the effectiveness of aerial reconnaissance. And so attempts to provide responsive fire support largely failed. And what we see at Festiburg is frequently artillery being ordered to carry out 15-minute bombardments upon German strong points. The artillery are often firing blind. They don't have the benefit of uh, any kind of observation, be it aerial or ground. And they often end up firing into areas that are no longer occupied, that are no longer relevant, or sometimes even shelling friendly troops. And the frustrations of being unable to provide this responsive fire support fill after action reports in 1915. Many other methods to try and correct it are tried. Mounting guns being carried by mules are sent forward through the breach, but prove ineffective. They don't have enough uh, weight of fire. Uh, the mules are easily killed or driven off. Not effective. Armoured cars with three pounder guns are put on standby at the Battle of Orbo's Ridge to go through the breach. But of course, there's no breach made, and whether they could cross no man's land is doubtful too. Um, parapet guns, literally 18 pounders carried into the uh, British trenches. We specially built um, embrasures in front of them so they can fire high explosive directly at the German lines. I tried. These have some success, but they're extremely difficult to get into and out of position, assemble the ammunition. The infantry don't like them because they get in the way and they draw incoming German fire. They're not the ideal solution. And at loose, as the battle becomes somewhat more mobile after the first day, it's surprising how many battery commanders limber up and try and go forward with their guns. The artillery suffers a lot of casualties at loose, and a lot of them are because batteries are moving forward and getting remarkably close to the firing line. And this is born of a frustration, a desire to try and provide some sort of responsive fire support for infantry who are in trouble or facing difficulties. But ultimately, this problem is beyond the capabilities of the Army of 1915. And so this terrible trinity of problems, inexperience, lack of equipment, and a variety of methods, the, the, the um, solution has not yet been found to how artillery should support infantry and trench warfare, all combine to make the Royal Artillery largely toothless for much of 1915, outgunned, inexperienced, and without a, a, a set methodology for how it's going to carry out the attack. And all of this contributes to the defeats, the setbacks, 
and indeed the outright disasters such as Auburn's Ridge that affect the British Army in this period. So some assessments to finish. Just to reiterate that point, not only must we accept that the British suffer from the terrible trinity, but we're also engaging a superior opponent, an opponent that is superior in numbers, artillery numbers, artillery weight, artillery experience, and of course has the unbelievably important advantage in artillery warfare of occupying observation points. Something that we can't underestimate, we're often apt to underestimate this, but any of you who've been to the Orbis Ridge battlefield will know that when you stand looking at the German lines from the British trenches, it's absolute, you know, you can see almost nothing. When you stand on that tiny rise at Orbis Ridge, you can see so deep into the British position, it's very, very striking. And the Germans occupy the high ground. They occupy the superior ground and they have superior weaponry and numbers on their side. And this makes the Royal Artillery's task extremely difficult. And in these circumstances, perhaps we should praise the gunners for achieving what they did, rather than for criticising them for failing to achieve total victory. And yet, 1915 was not a complete whitewash for the British Army. There were tactical innovations that began to emerge by the end of 15. As I've said, the Battle of Loos marks something of a turning point for the Royal Artillery. There's a serious attempt to sit down and consider how they will um, deal with German defences in the coming year, 1916. Various methods that have been tried, such as the aforementioned parapet guns and so on, are abandoned. But there's greater emphasis on coordinating fire, having more complex fire plans, and ensuring communication networks remain in place during engagements. There's organisational changes. Core CRAs begin to have more authority. Artillery them, the artillery itself begins to regard train as full brigades and then uh, at a divisional level as well, so the fire can be more easily coordinated. There's better connections between the RFC and the gunners. The gunners begin to understand the value of the, uh, of the RFC and the RFC begin to understand the difficulties of the gunners and this will bear fruit for the Somme offensive in 1916. There's also, perhaps most importantly, various technical improvements. Sound ranging, mapping and survey work improve. Meteorology, meteor meteor ah, I'm gonna, the weather becomes an important consideration in how this affects the flight of shells. Air to ground cooperation improves and there's increasingly sophisticated fire plans which try and take into account the experience the Royal Artillery has had in 1915. The first sound ranging section of the British Army is um, on the Western Front by October 1915, for example, and will go on to perform crucial work through 16 and 17. It doesn't arrive in time for loose, but the work the sound ranging section does will ultimately put it through like three, several steps ahead of the Germans in this regard. But all these innovations, improving maps, improving understanding of the weather, and the use of sound ranging all begin in 1915. The fruit that they bear will only become apparent in 16 and especially in 1917. A great deal, therefore, remains to be done. At the end of 1915, a very strong case can be made that on the Western Front, the British Army had been defeated. It had not achieved its objectives in any of the battles, with the possible exception of the defensive battle of Second Ypres, where Ypres had remained in Allied hands. The Royal Artillery accepted it had a great deal still to do, and its performance at Luz was a source of frustration to itself. And it's interesting to look at after action reports that were produced after Luz, where they assess what had gone wrong and consider how things might be improved. And a lot of it maps back to these technical improvements which were now beginning to come online. And furthermore, in 16, the Royal Artillery will greatly increase in strength, both in equipment and ammunition. But a great deal still needed to be done. It had been a very difficult and hard fought year for the British Army. But the blood of defeat would water the eventual seeds of victory. The innovations that had been developed, or the ideas that had been developed by the Royal Artillery by the end of 1915, were essentially those that would carry it through the rest of the First World War. Yes, there were still innovations to come, creeping barrages and so forth, back barrages and various other complex manoeuvres of artillery. But the basic concepts that the Royal Artillery had developed, the importance of air-to-ground cooperation, the value of these technical innovations, the importance of sophisticated and properly organised fire plans would provide the basis for all the artillery developments that would follow in 1916-17 and indeed 18. And as the artillery grew in experience, its equipment improved and its technical capacity improved, so too would its methods improve. And the you know, mighty barrages that followed in 17 and 18 
can be, you can trace that process right back to these very difficult, hesitant, and indeed costly beginnings that occurred in 1915. And so, to refer back to that great historian of the First World War, James Edmonds, the disasters of 1915 make it especially worthy of study, for in remembrance of our final victory, we're apt to forget the painful and weary stages by which it was reached. 1915 marked the first of those painful steps that would ultimately lead to victory in 1918. Thank you very much. Mademoiselle Clement, monsieur, same to you. Sing it with all your heart and soul and see everyone right under the pole. Mademoiselle Clement, monsieur. Up in his aeroplane one night when Robinson called a flight. Everything all right. Beautiful moonlight night. Circled around the moon a while it's wonder to explain. Look in the loop above the clouds and what do you think he saw? Mademoiselle from Armentier's Parlez-vous Mademoiselle from Armentier's Time to do Sing it with all your heart and soul and see everyone right up the pole Mademoiselle from Armentier's Time to do 